Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and today we're bringing you the second in a series of episodes focusing on Threat Horizon 2022, when digital and physical worlds collide. ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin is back with me today. When we last spoke, you shared a broad overview of the threats that business enterprises will face between now and 2022, as well as advice for proactive leaders. But today, I want to talk to you about two areas you mentioned before. I want to start with the consumer backlash against behavioral analytics. And then, even though it's terrifying, I do want to discuss deep fakes. So let's start with that consumer backlash. I understand that organizations' insatiable desire to understand consumers through behavioral analytics will result in an invasive deployment of cameras, sensors, applications in public and in private life. And you're anticipating a consumer and regulatory backlash to these intrusive practices as individuals begin to get really clear about the consequences of all of this monitoring. That's right, Tavia. You know, highly connected ecosystems of digital devices will enable organizations to harvest, repurpose and indeed sell sensitive behavioral data about consumers without their consent. With attackers having the potential to then target and and compromise poorly secured systems and databases at will. So a very real challenge and indeed issue. Impacts to that are going to be felt across industries such as retail, gaming, marketing, insurance, that are already dependent on behavioural analytics to sell products and services. And there are also a growing number of sectors that will see an increased dependency on behavioural analytics that include finance, healthcare and education. Organised criminal groups, hackers and indeed competitors will begin stealing and compromising these treasure troves of sensitive data. And an organisation whose business model is dependent on behavioural analytics is going to be forced to backtrack potentially on costly investments as their practice is deemed to be based on mass surveillance and seen as a growing privacy concern by both regulators and indeed consumers alike. Data gathered from sensors and cameras in the physical world will be used to supplement data already captured by digital platforms to build consumer profiles of really unprecedented detail. Hmm. The gathering and the monetization of data from social media has already started facing widespread condemnation. Isn't that true? It is. It is. And in fact, regulators have determined that some organizations' practices are indeed unethical. So an example would be Facebook, for instance. Facebook's role in using behavioral data to affect political advertising for the European referendum resulted in the UK's Information Commissioner's Office fining the organization the maximum penalty of half a million pounds in late 2019. And the ICO cited a lack of protection of personal information and privacy and failing to preserve a strong democracy. I think even so, many organisations and governments will become increasingly dependent on behavioural analytics to underpin business models, as well as for monitoring the workforce and citizens. The development of smart cities is only going to serve to amplify the production and gathering of behavioural data with people interacting with digital ecosystems and technologies throughout the day in both private and public spaces. Mm. Data is going to be harvested, repurposed and indeed sold to third parties, while the analysis will provide insights about individuals that they didn't even know themselves, potentially. Mm. That fine of £500,000 is meaningless, I would think. It depends on the size of organisation, of course. But, uh, yeah, for some organisations of the size that we're talking about, it's a real blip. It doesn't even figure in the accounts, does it? Do you think that companies are really accurately anticipating how fiercely consumers are going to respond to those invasions of privacy? Well, if they don't, they soon will. I think that's the reality because an increasing number of individuals and consumer rights groups are realising how invasive behavioural analytics really can be. Hmm. Are there any examples of that backlash? We have this £500,000 fine, which for Facebook is, I think, pocket change to Zuckerberg. But other examples of a consumer backlash? Sure. I mean, over in the United States, for instance, New York's Hudson Yard in 2019. Um, This is an instance where management required visitors to sign away the rights to photographs that they were taking of a specific building. But... As is all too often, the obligation was hidden within the small print of the contract that was signed by visitors upon entry. Hmm. So these visitors, when they found out, boycotted the building and sent thousands of complaints, resulting in the organisation having to backtrack and rewrite the contracts. Another substantial backlash that we've seen in the UK 
surrounding invasive data collection was in London when Argent, which is a biometrics vendor, used facial recognition software to track individuals across a 67-acre site surrounding King's Cross Station without consent. Wow. It's not just that these practices are invasive and that they compromise privacy, right? It's that that consumer data is so easily hackable. I think, you know, attackers see these swathes of really highly personal data as key targets, as you would. For example, data relating to individuals' personal habits, medical insurance details present very enticing prospects indeed. And organisations that don't secure that information are going to face further scrutiny and potential fines from regulators. The answer is for organisations that have invested in a range of sensors, cameras, applications for data gathering and behavioural analysis, well, they should really ensure that the current technical infrastructure that they're using is secure by design. And we've talked about that a lot as well, this notion of building security in from the ground up rather than trying to retrofit it. Perhaps more challenging is going to be that it's compliant with regulatory requirements because that is going to continue to change. And as I've said many an occasion, the very notion of a consistent regulatory system is really something that we're nowhere near. I mean, at the moment at the ISF, we're doing significant amount of work in really trying to understand the different regulatory environments uh, around the world that our members are active in to really give them some insight into that. And, And that is no mean feat. The other challenge, of course, is it will change very rapidly. So in the short term, these sorts of organisations you know, that are gathering this information really do have to build and incorporate data gathering principles into a corporate policy. They need to create transparency over data gathering practices and use. And they need to understand the legal and contractual exposure that they face on harvesting, repurposing and indeed selling data. Hmm. I think if we look much longer term, then organisations really should be implementing privacy by design across the organisation identifying the use of data in supply chain relationships. Again, it's not just within your own organisation. And ensuring that algorithms which are increasingly being used in behavioural analytic systems are not skewed or biased towards particular demographics. Right. Well, let's talk for a moment about deep fakes, which, as I've said before, really trouble me. That is another area of very serious threat, isn't it? It is a serious problem. I think the advancements and the increasing availability of AI technologies will really enable attackers to create highly realistic digital copies of executives in real time by superimposing facial structures and using vocal patterns to mimic real voices. And as deepfake technologies become more believable, many organisations will be impacted by this new and indeed highly convincing threat. Organisations that use perhaps poor quality audio and video streaming services will find it particularly challenging to identify this threat as the imperfections in even the most simplistic deepfakes will go unnoticed. This is technology that we've touched on in the past, um, but it sounds like the time has come for deepfakes to move out of the category of coming threats and... Now that problem has fully arrived. I think that uh, certainly the development of deep fakes is progressing quickly. Um, with the first case of AI assisted vishing, for instance, that's social engineering using an automated voice, used to perform a high profile scam in early 2019, almost a year ago now. So attackers replicating the voice of an energy company's CEO were able to convince individuals within the organization to transfer almost a quarter of a million dollars to a fake supplier. Hmm. So how did they do it? Well, the attackers used social engineering techniques to trick an employee into calling the CEO and as the voice on the other end of the phone sounded exactly the same as the CEO's, the employee went ahead with the transfer. Advanced deep fakes of high-profile individuals or executives will threaten, I think, to undermine digital communication, which, again, we're all using increasingly, Mm -hmm. spreading highly credible fake news and, unfortunately, misinformation. I think we're going to see deep fakes appearing with alarming frequency and realism, accelerating and perhaps turbocharging social engineering attacks. If we look at the underlying AI technology as well, I think there is the potential for that to be used to manipulate both video and audio, enabling attackers to really accurately impersonate individuals. As attackers use increasingly sophisticated deep fakes, they'll cause serious financial damage, manipulating perhaps public opinion with fake videos and images in order to manipulate financial markets or promote a political agenda or indeed gain a competitive advantage. Mm. 
And, you know, all of that means that we're going to see severe reputational damage, which could be caused when executives or high profile individuals have their identities compromised. Because the challenge here is that we have taken ourselves into an environment where we believe what we see, particularly on social media. It must be true. And so winding that back is going to be even more challenging. And I think that means that organisations, individuals, we're all going to face a new breed of security challenges beyond anything that we've had to deal with before. And, you know, nation states, activists and, and hacking groups inevitably will use deep fakes to spread disinformation, I think, at scale, leaving individuals and organisations unable to distinguish fact from fiction, truth from lies. We've always had propaganda that relied on the manipulation of images. So what makes deep fakes actually more concerning? That's right. I mean, you know, manipulation of images has a considerable history. Uh, And you're right, those manipulated images are very often used as propaganda in times of conflict. But now, with the easy availability of digital tools, the highly realistic nature of the doctored content and the existence of new media channels to distribute misinformation, deep fakes are a viable attack mechanism. And with a growing number of important government elections due to begin across the world in uh, 2020, 2021, the impact of deep fakes is likely to far exceed that of existing fake news, which we've all been concerned about up until now. In fact, popular mobile applications, take Snapchat as an example, you know, allow individuals to create deep fake content pretty easily. And attackers will be able to buy and sell highly convincing deepfake technologies or services on the dark web and use bots to generate fake content on social media. So it's already bad and it's getting worse. (laughs) So what are we to do? How can a business leader guard against this really threatening technology? Well, organizations need to enhance current technical security controls to mitigate against the threat of deepfakes to the business. Again, if we think about the purpose of the Threat Horizon series of reports, it isn't to be alarmist. It's to highlight particular threats that then allow organisations to get a head start. Yeah. You know, training and awareness, that's another need. We'll need to revamp it. We'll need to give special attention to this highly believable, I think, threat. And right away, security leaders should incorporate an understanding of deepfakes into their security awareness programmes. And they should run, I think, and this piece is really important, an executive level awareness program that focuses on deep fakes. Longer term, what should they do? Well, action should include enhancing or perhaps investing in identity controls, content management products to protect against deep fakes, reviewing authorization processes for financial transactions in the context of deep fakes, and monitoring deep fake activities in related industry sectors. So it's all about having what I often refer to as an eyes open approach to this and then putting in place what are appropriate controls for your business, for your organisation to really guard against some of the things we've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, these conversations are a bit overwhelming. Thinking about deep fakes and misinformation is overwhelming. But even though deep fakes are coming at us fast, threats like the hacking of the consumer data wake consumer anger in response to their privacy being compromised, data mining, data insecurity, all of these have the potential for serious disruption. But as always, it's really helpful to have your voice as a proactive guide through these subjects, because I know that we can either ignore it and hope wrongly that it will work itself out or that we will never be affected, or we can just close up shop. And neither are wise choices. So as you encourage, we can be proactive increase our level of awareness and education, and really get ahead of it, get ready to take on the contemporary security challenges that we face. Let's have you back one more time for a third and final conversation around that internet of forgotten things, the systems that involve computation, sensing, communication, actuation that are left unpatched, unsupported, and still network controlled. Spoiler alert, that is a big problem. So let's walk through that next time. In the meantime, listeners, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review it, and we'd love it if you'd share it in your networks. Be sure to visit securityforum.org to join the conversation on our LinkedIn group, access show notes, and download ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance relating to this discussion. Thank you for listening.